numbers seen, uh, number of ambulances, numbers seen. ERs are different. It depends on if it's a trauma center, a big hospital, um, a, a le level one is trauma, level two is like a Sequoia, 24-hour ER doc. And we, would, we see probably at Sequoia 25,000 patients a year. So that can be anywhere from on a slow day 50 to a high day of 100. So, and that's in a 24 hour period, all different levels. Ambulances, probably two to eight ambulances a day. San Mateo County sees about 125 ambulances a day. So that's how many ambulances are dispatched all over. Um, let me tell you about how the system works in San Mateo County. We do not have a trauma center in San Mateo County. Now, years ago, when I started there, we did. There were a lot of trauma designations. In San Mateo County, there were probably, you know, almost every other hospital was trauma. It wasn't cost effective. It wasn't doing anybody well. Most traumas are people that are indigent, have no money, drunk, whatever, a lot of major traumas. So hospitals, part of the trauma system requires that you have a surgeon in-house, an anesthesiologist in-house, and they couldn't afford it. You couldn't afford to keep them in house for these patients that you might see uh, in a trauma center. You know, in a big trauma center, you see a lot, but in like Sequoia, we wouldn't see that many. But enough so that, you know, it made it kind of crazy and busy at times. But anyway, they realized San Mateo County, it wasn't cost effective for anybody. So San Mateo County is cut in half at, at 92. The north of 92 goes to SF General, the south of 92 goes to Stanford. Those are major trauma centers, okay? Just so you know, that's how it works. And that's how it works now in most um, big cities um, because it's easy to transport them, it's quicker to transport them, than to keep a trauma center open, you know, and the cost of it. It was just really prohibitive. Um, so, let's see, what else can I talk? Oh, did we get it yet? Oh, we did, okay, great. Um, county communications, so there is a county, um, yeah, no, I, I'll play, yeah, it's so an item already. I got it. The Paul Did you get it? Okay. okay, it's pretty basic PowerPoint. It's like my first one, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> you know how I am about this. Um, so, county communications is the hub. That is where, like, um, I'll, and I'll go through this. Like, if you if you call nine one one, okay, you're out here. You call nine one one. Then it goes to dispatch. <coughs> is really still there until we transfer it to our bed, okay? 
So anyway, so then the patient comes on the call, the paramedics call the ER, say I'll be there in five minutes, two minutes, whatever. They give you a little bit of lead time. Then the patient arrives, and again, depending on the acuity of the patient, the patient goes to a regular room or they go to a code room, a busy room, okay? And then they get, then the care starts in the ER. So that's a little bit about how it works out there in the field. And usually, it's hilarious because the paramedics who in the ambulance have brought the patient hang out because everybody, they all want to know how the patient turns out, especially the STEMIs, which are the, the heart attacks and the strokes. But the fire trucks, this always cracks me up, that they all come in with a big old freaking fire truck. You can only imagine how much that costs to the ER. They all come because they just want to find out too. Plus, they're not that busy and they're just doing something. <laughs> so it's really, it's hilarious, but it's such a, com like I said, it's such a close-knit group and you know everybody. You know in the ER, you know the firemen, the paramedics, the local police, you know everybody because they're in and out all the time. Okay, so, um, okay, walk in, how a patient enters and leaves the ER. Okay, a walk in, as, patient, as patients do, they walk in now. A really sick patient can walk in. A heart attack, a stroke. People don't always call the ambulances. A lot of times, people, oh, I don't need an ambulance, I don't need an ambulance. But, and so they just come in on their own or have a family member bring. But it's, I, it, there's an intuition of an ER nurse that you can look at somebody and go, oh my God, they're sick as shit. Oh my God, put them in, you know, get them to a room right away. There's something wrong. <laughs> no, I'm serious, you just have this, you have this assessment skill. And I don't know, my people might know it. I, I would say, did you notice their pupils were different? No, I didn't know, you know, because you just notice everything about patients. Because that's, that's what you do. An ICU nurse can tell you everything about lab and pathophys. An ER nurse just can tell you the basics of taking care of somebody that is dying and, and shipping them out, okay? Anyway, so um, ambulance, police. Okay, the police a lot of times will bring patients in that are, that are on hold you know, that are going to jail, but they have a medical issue. So they have to be, have a medical clearance before they can go to jail. So the police will bring patients into the ER for that. And a lot of times it's chest pain, because they don't want to go, you know. I mean, there's not <laughs> always, a, they kind of sometimes make up stuff a little, but they have to take care of it. They can't just take him to jail and find out the guy dies in jail because he had a heart attack. So we will take care, and they all come in and they're usually handcuffed. And actually, they're usually the nicest, the nicest people, so. Um, now, transfers, types of transfers. I'll quickly go over this. Pediatric transfers. Every hospital that doesn't have peds, and there's a lot of hospitals, peds, um, there's not a lot of spots for pediatric peds. Well, we can, we stabilize, hold them, we'll do whatever it needs to do to, to get that patient ready to transfer, but we have to wait for the tra a transport team from Lucille Packard. We have to wait till they have a bed. Sometimes they don't have a bed, so we're holding the, the, these patients for hours and hours and overnight. And we have to wait for the, the, PD, the critical care transport team shows up and they transfer. So it's a formal thing, it's a transfer. The paperwork is all done and you, you basically, because we're not a pediatric <coughs> facility, unless it's under one month, if we do have a baby, we can put them upstairs to the Lucille Packard nursery that Sequoia has. So those have to be transferred. Um, psych, we don't have a psych unit anymore. Psych is one of the <coughs> most difficult um, places for placing patients because there's not a lot of psych facilities at all, especially <coughs> adolescent psych. I think there's only one spot. Yeah. So a lot of times, now if it's a 5150 that is unstable, we can admit to ICU. And then they're watched, um, you know, in ICU because they're watched as a one-on-one, -on -one, but eventually that patient has to be transferred. But if it's just a patient that's stable that says I'm suicidal, you know, and I need help, we have to find them a bed and transfer them, okay? And again, that, it, it's really difficult. There's not a lot of psych facilities that have beds available. That's not within a certain amount of time as well, 5150, within the, like 24 hours or something like that, that they need to be transferred, or is there not? No, time? there's no time. No time. But there are whole, when you're on at 5150, you have a 72 hour. <coughs> and so it starts once the ER doc puts the hold on. But we want to get them out of there, trust me. We don't have the manpower to watch these people or to you know spend time, especially if it is somebody suicidal. It was so great when we had a psych unit, trust me. It, it was the best because 
they were so good at taking these patients and we could admit and it was so much easier. So that's, that's one of the big transfer things. SARTs, do you guys know what that is? Okay, that's the, do you know, anybody know? No, sexual assault response team. So if you have somebody coming in that's uh, um, been raped or um, attacked and there's, they want to file a report or they want, what you do is you call this team. Simply because it's a special training. We used to do it in the ER and get the training, but it takes a, it takes a nurse, pull, pulls a nurse way out of the line of fire, and you spend a lot of time with this person, and you don't have that staff in the ER. So the SART team comes, and they come from San Mateo County, and it's a team of nurses, and they they treat these. It, it's wonderful, actually. It, you know, they know what to ask. They know how to collect evidence. That's another thing that's huge. Um, and to how to do the exam. So they'll come and either see the patient in the ER in the room, or if the, if the patient's pretty stable and okay with it, they'll transfer them to San Mateo County General, and then they'll do the exam there. So that's the SART team. Trauma. This is a brand new thing. Actually, it's not brand new. It's probably um, now probably 10 years old, 8 years old. Um, trauma transfer. So believe it or not, in the ER, we will call a trauma transfer. If we call 911 from the ER, Sequoia ER, Mind you, we have ER docs, we have everybody, we can, we can take care of traumas. We can take care of them in the ER. But a trauma transfer can get that trauma patient to Stanford quicker than I can get a surgeon in or an anesthesiology in, anesthesiologist in. They transport 911, they can be at um, uh, um, Stanford in probably 10 minutes. And there's a direct contact from the ER doc to the Stanford ER doc, we're transferring a trauma. Now, do you know what, what designates a trauma? Mechanism of injury. Mechanism, mechanism of injury is how the person was injured. So if you were hit, you're, you're at a stop sign and a car hits you from behind and they're going two miles an hour, that, there's no mechanism really. That's pretty easy. But if a car slams into you at 80 in the back and you're sm smashed in your car, that's a high mechanism, mechanism of injury. So that would be considered a trauma transport. If somebody falls off a roof and impales himself or has major fractures, that's a trauma. So it just depends on how, what happens. If they get stabbed, shot, gunshot wounds, those are traumas. But those get transferred. So it, it took our ear docs a long time to kind of say, oh, we're going to transfer this. Because they're so used to you know, taking care of these patients. But in reality, they're better, they get better care when they're taken to Stanford. Because the whole team is ready for them and all that kind of so it, it's a kind of a, a new weird thing. Okay, next slide. I'm gonna be talking a little too much. <laughs> okay, like I said, you can walk in the ER. Now the roles of the ER staff, you can see I probably could have bulleted some of these, but oh well. Um, the ERMD, he's on 24 hours. Um, they do have PAs now that come in in the middle of the day that will take the non really urgent, non urgent type things, the sore throats, the sprains, the lacerations, that kind of stuff. And they might start somebody that's a, a more advanced, but the ER doc is in command of the whole department. Mm -hmm. they're, they're wonderful people, they really are. And you know, that's one of the relationships that we all have with them is, you know, we don't, everything, there's so much, pretty much standing orders in the ER. So you come in with a chest pain, the nurse gets your EKG, starts your IV, draws your blood before the doctor is even near the room. So a lot of that goes on and that's the relationship that happens in the ER. And has to happen because that, to keep things going. Okay, the, okay there's a triage, there's a charge, let me do the charge nurse first. The charge nurse is the person, um, she kind of is overseeing the whole department. She it, tries to get admissions up, she sees what beds are available, who's moving in, who's moving out, so kind of the overseer. I think the triage nurse is probably the hardest role to play. That is the person that has to decide, okay, you're gonna look at that patient, oh, they're sick, let's get them in a room right away, or that patient can go in the waiting room. A triage is um, basically there's three types of assessments that you do, uh, primary, secondary, and ter tertiary um, it are real assessments. Primary is what a triage nurse does, and they basically just oversee, look, figure out what's going on, three minutes. You can't, you shouldn't spend much more than that because you, you just are assessing quickly where, where in line this patient goes. And again, some patients will go in quicker ahead of others in the waiting room because they're not that sick. I mean, it makes sense, right? Um, so then 
the, the patient goes to the room, is assigned to a room, and the, the room nurse, and each nurse uh, ratio is four to one in the ER, unless they're really, uh, depending on acuity, will have three or four patients in, in rooms. And that nurse will immediately start a line, O2, draw blood, do whatever it takes. Uh, put an NG, do what it needs to do right off the bat, okay, to get going with that patient. Because you want to get the labs back. You want to get the x-rays back. You don't want them in the ER forever. You want them in and out as quick as possible. So you draw blood right away and get it ready to, to go down to the lab, okay? Um, and then we have an ER tech on nights. Now they're kind of starting to put them on days. And they're both mostly to, you know, do scrubbing of lacerations, clean the bed, do EKGs, transport to um, CT, that kind of thing. It's an ER tech. And the ACs are the secretaries at the desk, and I think they're the best in the world. They're command central, and they pretty much know where everybody is, what's going on, and what's happening. Plus, they have to be nice when they answer the phone. They, you know, I mean, they're meters and greeters. Okay. Um, so we have um, some acute emergencies that you see in the ER. Um, sepsis. This is a brand new big one. Actually, it's probably been five years now that they used to admit people with like a pneumonia or a urinary tract infection called urosepsis, and they wouldn't. There wasn't a protocol. Now they realize that septic patients, they, their lactic acid increases and they die. They're they're not treated like they should be. They're not given the fluids. They're not res fluid resuscitations. That's not done. So now there's a sepsis protocol. So if a patient comes in and has like a high temp, a high blood pressure, a rapid heart rate, what, like three basic things, then you immediately start the sepsis protocol. So the triage nurse is responsible for starting the sepsis protocol. Oh, sure, can I say something? So that is one of the critical care bundle I put out on the document, and yeah. that is what uh, Sherry is talking about. Yeah. Yeah. about. yeah, it's a real, and it saves lives. I mean, we're doing things totally different than we did before with the sepsis bundle. But it's, um, it's really working, it's saving lives where, you know, they might be admitted to a floor instead of ICU. They get admitted to ICU if, they're like to, if, they're, and if their labs show it, indicate it. STEMI, do you know what STEMI is, you guys? ST elevation MI, okay, that's what STEMI stands for. That's a heart attack, and that's a serious heart attack. Um, and that, there's a whole protocol for that as well. And um, Sequoia, there's, um, most hospitals, now are STEMI certified and stroke certified. So you have to go through a whole process of having everything in order to take care of a STEMI. So in a STEMI, um, part of the process, the nurse does the EKG in three minutes and the door to a drug time to the cath lab is 20. So when you get a STEMI, you immediately run quick to get that patient to the cath lab to open up that vessel, which is of the patient having a heart attack. <coughs> now the paramedics now too, since we're stroke or STEMI and stroke certified, when they get a STEMI in the field, they immediately send us an EKG and say, we've got a STEMI, and right away we call the cath lab even before the patients are arrived because we know the patient's having a serious heart attack and you want to act as soon as you can. So STEMI, stroke, we're doing that for stroke as well. So if a patient is got, the paramedics will call and say, if we have a stroke patient, we have the same kind of protocol that we do to take care of that patient. And again, it, it depends on when they have the symptoms, what symptoms they're having, all that kind of stuff, okay? So that's another thing that would be good for them to mm -hmm. know the stroke code. Epiglottitis, do you guys know what that is? You yeah. pediatric kids? Yeah. 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 yeah, that's a serious PD emergency. Um, and I've only actually seen one once and they, you know, they, want, they have a high-pitched whine and they, they're just really, really sick. So you don't want to excite these kids, you want to keep them calm, um, you know, but you're still nervous as hell because in one second they could stop breathing. I mean, it's a really scary thing. Um, pulmonary embolus, um, you guys know what pulmonary embolus is, right? That goes to the lungs, like a DVT or whatever. Do you know what lab you're supposed to look for? What's the indicator that you have a PE? It's called a D-dimer. And a D-dimer is protein-based, and that means when you're clotting, you, your protein increases, there's a certain kind of thing that increases in your blood, and if that is positive, that indicates that you might have a PE. And then they do a VQ scan, CT, and they, to show that, yes, in fact, you do. Um, so that's, that's one of the ectopics. Um, ectopics happen, they're a serious emergency. They, they can be stable and very unstable when they come to the ER. So it's something you have to act on really quickly. 
um, dissecting aorta. This is scary as crap. This somebody comes in with back pain, sudden back pain, and drop in blood pressure. And you just again go by history, and they go to CT, and their aorta is wide open. Now you can take them to surgery and save them, but it's not. It doesn't happen that often. It's a really not a good sign. And a lot of time, again, it's a mechanism. You know, if you smashed, uh, if you, it's a, a deceleration injury or whatever, and it cracks open your aorta. But it's, it, it does happen more often than you think, but it's a scary thing. And I've seen where they've actually sewn it back together, the aorta, and fixed patients, if they get to the OR as quick as possible. <laughs> um, code blue, so you guys know what a code blue is. Um, and that's, we get those a lot. CPR in progress, coming in. We do save a lot of lives. I mean, it's amazing. They don't all die, um, you know, with all the stuff that the, it's, it depends on how quickly they were responded and resuscitated in the field, and then how quickly, you know, the minute we get in and take care of them, and people do live. The ER docs and the ER staff respond to code blue in the hospital. So if there's a code blue up on the floor, <coughs> the ER doc runs up there, um, actually, it's after hours now because the intensivist does it during the middle of the day. But um, you know, I was in the ICU last night, and they called the code blue on the patient that I was with. So um, the air docs did come up and we did CPR and stuff. It was good. Oh, wow. Did they? Did, did you did a lot of CPR? Yeah. 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 Did the patient live? Yeah. Oh God, you have oh, you have Damon. Yeah. yeah. So I was actually just going last night just to meet him for the yeah. first time, yeah. and he's so like, "Hey, you want to stay?" So I stayed for like three hours and oh, I'll take care of the patient. But it was. So what did you do? Yeah, I did compressions, did um, awesome. which is so difficult. I've never done it before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a really big guy. That's why they rotate. It was usually. so hard. Yeah, um, and the bed was a little bit too high, so I feel like I was. You did know, they put a stool? Because a lot of times they'll shove a stool. No, in and they put the, the thing under his back and stuff. But it was yeah. really like I was like sweating and like it was really good. But you saw the team. Right? <laughs> Absolutely, it was so calm and yeah, like and it organized. Was just so chaos. like methodical, and I I never seen a coach before, but it was like yeah. I don't want to say. Quick Oh yeah, no, it's just, it's amazing. And you think it looks like a big disaster zone because every there are people, you know, but everybody kind of knows, okay, if you're doing this, I'll do that or blah, blah, blah. And, and somebody will yell out what to do next. Which ER doc do you remember? What did he look like? I think Oldham came up. Oh, George yeah. Oldham. Yeah. 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 He, was, yeah. he wasn't up for very long because he had a PEA, the patient, and so they gave him his IV and stuff. And oh, yeah. CPR. See what I mean? So it's hard sometimes for the ER doc to get up there because he's got an ER full. So a lot of times the ICU nurses too, they're used to running codes, so they might start something. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course they will. And then the ER doc gets up there and you know oversees and stuff like that. So yeah, it's um, it can be, you know, again, some days it's like a fireman, you know, it's dead slow in the ER, but then all of a sudden it takes off and you never say the Q word like everybody knows, you know, you <laughs> never say that. Um, okay. Um, the tamponade obviously is off pressure on the heart so it doesn't beat correctly. Blunt trauma um, is somebody that, again, you know, gunshot or knife or stab or whatever, um, and you don't pull anything out. If, it, if something's impaled in somebody, you never pull it out because basically that's tamponading whatever is in there. And the minute you pull that out, it could hemorrhage. I mean, it could be a holy disaster. So they go like that to the OR, and they look so, it, it's just a scary sight, but that's how they go. Uh, super infections, um, I've seen somebody that had like a staph infection, you know, a staph is a skin infection on their arm and it's a small wound, all of a sudden for some reason it goes into his system, in their body and within probably half hour they could die if you don't treat them and they turn purple, you know, they, they get blotchy skin and you have to, so, and strep, I've seen somebody with a, a full body strep infection from a wound. So it's a weird dynamic, and you, it's quick assessment and quick IV antibiotics, quicker than you can imagine. A broad spectrum, every kind you can, because they could turn into a huge, ten times worse than what they are. Um, and then hemopneumothorax, and you see, we see those on the floor. That happens. Okay, next. Yeah. Sometimes are hard for us in the ER when you're taking care of people that are really sick. 
you know, you just are, you, and saving lives, and you see people that you really want to care for, and then you have patients that sometimes your whole heart isn't into it, but they still deserve 100% care as well. The chronic pain patients are really difficult a lot of times because they keep coming back, and they do, they are in chronic pain, and they have issues, but as an ER nurse, it's really difficult to feel compassion for these patients that keep coming back, and, and you can't give them enough drugs, you know, you can't give them enough meds, and you're not going to take care of them, and it's really not the place to, to do some psychology with them. You know, we try to refer them to chronic pain places, <coughs> but those, they're just difficult patients. Cultural differences, um, a lot of times, even though we got, we've gotten to know which patients are more whiners and which ones are more uh, stoic and all that kind of stuff, but even so much as a Hispanic mom with her baby, they will wrap the child in 20 blankets and, tw and they've got a fever of 104. And we're like, no, please take the blankets off. Although they're saying, just ignore it now because it's not worth hassling with the poor mom, but it just makes the kid even hotter. But in their mind, they, that's what the thinking is. Keep them warm, keep them warm. Remember, we talked about those one time. But, but now they're, they're kind of letting go of that. Um, Drug-seeking behavior, again, you, you know who the uh, returnees are or the, um, what's the word? Uh, frequent, frequent flyers, yeah, which is a terrible ER thing, but that's, you know, you just know. And in the county now, we really try to, we communicate with the other ERs about so-and-so, you know, he comes in for blah, 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 don't give him this, da, da, da. We're, we're, and, and the ER docs will stop giving them, you know, because they know what they want. They're always allergic to Advil. <laughs> They're always allergic to the basic things that you would try first, um, for whatever reason. So, um, but it, again, you know, they deserve care. Everybody that walks into the ER gets care. You cannot refuse anybody. You cannot refuse. It's against the law. You have to treat everybody that comes in to be seen. Um, access issues. This is really, it's a, another, it's a part of education as well. There are so many people out there that don't have doctors don't have a way to get a doctor, can't, you know, for follow-up. We take care of somebody and we try to give them as much antibiotic, as much, um, like I will give, like lacerations, I'll get bandages, I'll steal from the cupboard, give them as much as they can, because you know they will go home and they won't have any of this and they won't get a follow-up. You know, they, they, we refer a lot of people to Pharaoh's Clinic. Well, there's no appointments for two months. So they come back to the ER. So the ER is their doctor. They'll put George Oldham as their primary care doctor. He's one of the ER docs. You know what I'm saying? Because they just, and they won't hear you when you say you can't be doing this, you can't, oh, no, no, speak. And you know they know what you're talking about, you know. But you see them anyway. It's just, it's just so sad because they just don't, um, they just don't have any place to go. Um, very minor, okay. And very bizarre. We see some crazy bizarre patients. Snake bites, this is a funny one. We actually have a snake bite kit and you have to keep it up to date. Every summer we have one or two rattlesnake bites. And so you have to treat them with the anti-venom. And a lot of times if we run out because they need a lot, we have to send a taxi or police officer to Kaiser or the local, the next ER to pick, get more venom to give to them. So it's one of those high risk, low time, and one of those things that you hardly ever do, but you have to be prepared for. Spider bites, poisoning, um, there's a lot of poisoning of ingesting, like children ingest things in the cupboard or whatever. Uh, what, what do you think is the number one, the, the number one thing that you don't want to be poisoned by? The worst, the worst over the, uh, over the counter thing? Drano. Drano. Probably Drano, but Tylenol. Uh, Tylenol is the worst medication. Because you can go into liver failure in a very short amount of time. Uh -huh. You can take as much aspirin, you'll just bleed a little bit. You can take Advil, but Tylenol is by far, and we do Tylenol, the minute they come in, you just start a protocol right away with that, because that, that is a really, really bad drug. Um, uh, foreign objects in odd places. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you how many times, I'll never forget this, this is really gross, but there are, you would not believe how many times things get stuck up rectum. And I'll never forget this one time, it was a uh, water bottle, like this. Uh, and the x-ray said, please recycle. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget that. Like, we were going to take it out and rinse it and use it, you know. And so, um, it, and it's amazing. And those usually have to go to surgery because you can't pull them back down. So they end up getting a, a 
a major surgery to get that object out. Um, and then kids will put things up their nose and in their ears and, you know, I, so you, you're always trying to get stuff out or to take care of things. But um, funny place, burns, um, burns, we, there is, if there's a major burn, it, gets, it goes to St. Francis. You always transfer to an area that can take care of really third de bad third degree burns. And as you guys know, it depends on how much of your body gets the burn and if they're first, second, or third degree. A tar burn. The ER gets tar burns all the time, where guys are working with the tar and they get it all over the body. And that is another burn, but the hard part with tar, you have to have like mayonnaise to take it off, the tar off their skin. Because you have to remember, it sticks. And you can't take care of a wound, you can't just rub it off, because that's just gonna peel more skin off. So you have to get that tar off. I remember one time, it took us like eight hours, I swear to God, this poor guy to get the tar off, before you could even take care of the burn on your knee. So um, fractures, um, get a lot of fractures, you get a lot of shoulder dislocations. I always have had the hardest time with orthopedic injuries, because to me it's so barbaric. You know, they just pull and stretch, and the orthopods will hit them on the, with a hammer, you know, and, but it, it's just, it's a weird <coughs> of medicine. But if it's an open fracture like that girl had, you know, who was drunk and happy, and she's going to be hurting so much. <laughs> she comes out, but let me tell you, that, that's a big deal. It has to go to surgery, it has to get antibiotics, it has to be washed. Open fractures are really dangerous for infections to set in. So, um, alcohol. Um, lots of alcoholics um, that come in, the same ones kind of return, and they want help, and they want to sober up, and you do the best you can, but they, they come back. A lot of times they're really, really sick and they get admitted. Sometimes you just give them um, food and new clothes and send them back out. And then they'll show up somewhere else a lot of times. It's a really, it's a sad disease that people, you know, there's no follow-up. There's they no place like, you can send these people. They yeah. have alcohol poisoning, what do, you, what do you do to treat that? Well, it depends on how bad they are. I mean, if they're like, on like the really comatose, you're going to intubate and put them in the ICU. But if they're just somebody drunk, you let them. You can't send them out with a, a BA that's elevated. So you have to hold them in the ER till their blood alcohol level comes down. So again, we feed them, give them clean clothes, just watch them until their blood alcohol comes down. It takes up a spot. I mean, it's a really difficult thing. And those guys usually are in the hallway in a gurney because you'll need their room. Um, so, but it's sad. There are some places that we can transfer them, but usually they want the alcohol level down. You know, they don't want to send somebody out. We can't send somebody out that's really drunk. Now, people can walk out if they want to, if they choose to do that. We can't force somebody to stay, and that does happen. We do call the police and say, so-and-so is drunk as a skunk, just walked out. <laughs> you might want to pick him up. And then they'll take, pick him up sometimes at the end of the street and take him to a alcohol detox place or a drop-off center. Some sort of center. consent or something for yeah. them to sign before they walk out? No. You can, if you can't catch them, they walk out. So, I mean, it, it, there's nothing you can do. You're not going to stop somebody. If, if you can get them to sign, if it's somebody that is of a right mind, then you have them sign the form. But it wouldn't do you any good to have a drunk sign the form because he, he doesn't know what he's signing. And it's not fair, right? Okay. Um, respiratory TB, um, hyperemesis TB, this is always a joke. Just like in RSA, we don't really know. So in the ER, we just assume by assessment, okay, they've been traveling in which country <laughs> and they're coughing and they look disheveled, they've been living in the street. So you kind of think, okay, might have TB. So you try to be, you know, you put, try to isolate them to an area and you put a mask on. But you really don't know until they get up to the yeah. floor and then find out, you know, and then all the ER nurses have to be tested again and it's a big circus. Um, <laughs> Hyperemesis, those are the pregnant ladies that just keep throwing up, throwing up, throwing up. And they come from their doc because they just need some IV um, hydration. And we take care of those too. If they can't go up to the infusion center or someplace else to get, to get the fluids. But I'm just trying to go over SVT, just like what the guy had. You know, uh, we get patients, um, he had rapid atrial fib, but we get patients that come in walking with uh, BTAC. And, and you know, you just have to t take care of them and treat them quickly. Angina, as you know, stable and unstable, we take that. Elderly, what you see mostly with the elderly is sepsis, like I talk, talked about, ural or respiratory fractures. Hip fractures is kind of a death sentence for a lot of old people. They, they go in with a hip fracture and they never go home um, because it's really hard to take, for them to get back into shape. Um, 
It's, it's, it's a sad thing. Failure to thrive. Um, little old people that don't all of a sudden have given up and they don't want to eat or drink or they don't have somebody taking care of them. I remember one lady that came in and, oh my God, she had to be 90 and her sister was keeping her under the bed on the floor. It was just the saddest story. And the woman was awake and alert when she came in. She was really bad and she died like you know, just because, and nobody's watching this stuff. You know, I mean, and what, what do you do? It's just so sad. Um, children. Respiratory. Children primarily are respiratory. Um, they, children are really difficult for always that come into the ER because they're usually very, very sick. Um, and it, especially by ambulance. And there's only so much you could do for them. So that, that's a really, it's a, we all have a sad children's story, and I'll tell you one of mine, I, I'll remember forever. It was when we were still at Trauma Center, and it was this young kid, he was about eight, and um, we got a call he, that he was coming in, he was on his bike, and that he'd been hit by a semi-truck. A truck had backed into him, and he rolled under the truck, and the truck dri had driven over him. But we got a call that he was coming in by code three by you know the paramedics and mm -hmm. firemen and he they had put the mask pants the mask pants are those remember those I don't know if you guys they're they're using them now again actually and it basically would uh, you put them on and it would squeeze just like a tourniquet so the blood would stay up in this part of the body so they had put these mask pants on and uh, they told us that you know this kid was basically his um, the glove which means his skin was wiped off, um, was torn down. But we didn't know, because he had these pants on when he came in, right? And so we put him in the room, and there was a surgeon there, everybody was there, and because it was a trauma. And um, he was talking, he was talking to me. Oh, am I gonna be okay? You know, I went tell my mommy I'm here, and blah, 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 blah. We took the pants off, he had literally nothing left from his waist down. He went to surgery, and I'll never forget, I was getting chills. And he says to me, am I going to live? Am I going to live? And he died in surgery. And everybody and their brother tried to, they worked up on him for like 20 hours. Plastic surgeons, vascular surgeons, everybody, they could to put him back together, but they couldn't. So, you know, those are, that's when you have those stress debriefings, after you have a case like that. Because you know where, who was affected? One of the people that was affected the most was the lady in the blood bank because she had to turn over something like 50 units of blood for this child in the OR. And you wouldn't even think of that, but that's how it affects everybody in the hospital. So that's why a lot of this stress debriefing is really important for, for cases like that. Um, okay, and we, the joke is vet medicine. Kids are vet medicine, as you guys know for that. So uh, about 20% of what you see in the ER, so we had 100 patients, about 20 of those patients would be Admissions. admissions take a lot of time and a lot of work for the ER nurse. And unfortunately, the relationship with the floor a lot of times is not as perfect as it should be because the ER nurse basically is just going to get that that patient stabilized, draw the blood, draw the put the IV, put the Foley, do what you need to do, and then get that patient upstairs. They're not going to do 100% of the assessment either. They're only going to assess what they really need to assess. That question? What is vet medicine? I don't know if I veterinary medicine. Okay. So that they having kids are just like if taking care of a kid is like taking care of a dog or a cat because a lot of times they can't communicate. Okay. So you're treating symptoms. So that's what we that's an <laughs> ER joke. Okay. <laughs> you guys didn't know that? No, no, no. <laughs> well, because it is. If you think about it, if the baby can't communicate, you have to assess that child in every aspect to find out why what's going on with this kid. You know, it's just like a, a puppy. You know, you don't know if he ingested something, just like the kid. Okay. So the county, uh, um, ERs, all ERs in a county are really involved um, <coughs> with the county, everything in the county, everything you have to do with the county. So an ER, in the ER is a big computer screen that has all the, all the emergency rooms in San Mateo County, Kaiser ER, Peninsula ER, it has a screen. And it has what their status, are they open, are they green, are they black, are they blue, whatever their status is in the ER. Are they overloaded, do they have too many ambulances? So we all know this. But they also, when you have a disaster drill, they will code us, they will ask us, how many patients can you take? What's the ring down? What, you know, if, if like the airport, 
when that, when that plane in the airport went down. They immediately, they go out there and say, what, how many can you take? Immediates, delayed, and you have to get a number. I can take two immediates, two serious ones. I can take three delayed and five non-acute. And that means that you would have to cram those patients in your ER. You, you gotta help and you have to tell them what you can do. So we communicate every time uh, there's a major disaster. If there's an MCI, mass um, a casualty incident, mass, in, whatever, in, MCI, mass casualty incident, which happens a lot, where there's, um, you know, trucks, um, there's auto accidents and there's two or three or four victims, then they, they pull us then, too, and we'll know about that. We'll get a ring down and be told, okay, on 92, blah, 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 da, 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 da. So then they'll pull us. How many can you take? Be ready, okay? So um, daily reporting of any outbreaks. Oh, my God. So the, uh, the swine flu, the, the um, what was the other, the N1, what was the N1? <coughs> H1N1, the regular flu, the measles. We have to report everything. We keep track in the ER of how many we see, and we have to report to the infection control people in the county. So those are things that the ER does too. They keep track of all that. Um, um, okay, I talked about county communications. STEMI and stroke cert certificates, we have to maintain those. We went after those. We could show that we had a cath lab team for the STEMI. We could show that our times were really good. We have to see X amount of STEMIs to maintain that certificate. Stroke, you have to get them to CT as quick as you can. You have to give them the DPA if you're going to within a certain amount of time. All those kind of things and their guidelines up throughout the country. It's a, uh, a, like I said, a major certificate, but we have to maintain it. We have to show by our patient care that we can still do it. So it's a big deal and it also makes us look good as a hospital. You want that. You want the strokes. Like San Mateo County General is not a stroke or STEMI certified. So those those patients don't, if you, uh, uh, ambulance picks up a STEMI, they won't go there. They'll go to the hospital that can do the strokes, okay? Um, and EMS meetings, we have meetings two and three times a month where we meet with all the people from all the county, the firemen, the police, the ambulance, the um, Red Cross, all this kind of stuff and coordinate everything. We do have disaster drills all the time, like two or three times a year. There's a statewide and you get victims and you pretend and you set up a tent, a triage tent outside the ER to pretend if you got a bunch of victims. So we go through that role so we're prepared. So you'll hear on the floor, you know, that they're calling a disaster drill. They really want you to think about that because we could use your help, but we act it in the ER, they act it. They go through the role of getting patients of what you would do. Of, you know, how are you going to treat this? Is it an earthquake? Is it, you know, what kind of patients are you going to expect? Is it a poisoning? You know, is it a gassing? Whatever. So, I think that's, is that it? Missy, did you have anything for Ebola? Um, yes, there is, there was an Ebola training throughout the hospital, actually. And what we would do, and the patients actually would come, there was one room in the ER designated. Some patients would go there and, or go directly to ICU to one area in the ICU that was isolated as nurses. Certain nurses were trained to take care of those patients. You have to act because you just never know, especially here in the Bay Area, because they come from all over the world in this area. You know what I'm saying? We're like a hub. So yes, there was, there's, there's always gonna be training and preparation. That's part of the whole EMS thing. And that's a requirement of the ER to be ready. Um, okay, so th this is a little fact, and I think I might have the five wrong, but who knows. I just know that for every hour a patient sits in the ER, once they're admitted and you can't get them upstairs, their, their um, discharge is delayed because their care is not, it's, they should be up on the floor being cared for and taken care of. In the ER, they're only gonna get what we need to do to take care of them and stabilize them, but they need their care and they need to get upstairs. So that's, that's something, it, this is my big thing is the overcrowding of the ER is pushing them up. ER has limited bed space, flow needs to move, hospital system must be in place to help, a surge capacity plan must happen to make a safe environment. Um, in other words, there's got to be a system in place, it's why I think they call code red triage or something. It worked for a while, but it's not working as much as it did before. And that means that ER is overloaded and we have, uh, we might have four admissions that need to go up and nobody's taking them, nobody's taking them, because you want to wait for the other nurse. Or, you know, for whatever, or we're out of ratios. 
Well, ER is never in ratio, and we can't do anything. We have to take these patients and take care of them. So the floor nurse needs to go out of ratio for a short amount of time until somebody comes in. It depends on who you're, who's up there and who's working. Some of them are much better about taking patients. Some are, you know, more understanding. But in the real world, I would love them to come down. You know, just like now that um, the clinical uh, ER nurses or clinical faculty, we really see what it's like on the floor and how bad it is and how crazy it is and how it's really nice in the ER because we have our ER doctor and we have standing orders. So we do a lot on our own. Up there, they have to call a doc and wait for them to call back. So there's issues on both sides. I just think uh, people should live in somebody's shoes. And I've forever tried to get some of the floor nurses to come down and look at the ER when it's really busy and see how bad it is and see that in the waiting room, people are throwing up in, in, in cans and people are laying on the floor because there's no more beds available in the, in the lobby, you know. <coughs> but it still hasn't happened. Um, uh, okay, this is more blah, 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 blah. <laughs> okay, camaraderie. Again, that's what happens in the ER. And I think that happens in ICUs and certain, you know, everybody, you build a camaraderie with the people you work. And we have a camaraderie <coughs> with the people in the county because we get to know them really. Um, gallows humor, I think I told you guys, uh, one of the things that you see all the time in the ER is um, a wedeo. Do you know what a wedeo is? Didn't I tell you this? Weekend dizzy all over. And that's what people, that's the, the, the it, wedeo. Yeah, it's a joke. I mean, we call them wedeos because they're people that come in and weekend dizzy all over. <laughs> and they get over here like, oh, for God's sake, please. In fact, there was a patient the other day because I was in the ER the other day to get my dose of it. And that the patient came in and said, I think I'm nauseated. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, please go home. You know? But you have to see him. So, and then this is an all time favorite, an old friend of mine. Uh, this is from years ago, this one. F O F O F. Oh, Wait. I get it. <laughs> Fall on face on floor. <laughs> And just like LOM, you know, you've got LOM and um, uh, is, um, and what is it? What's the other one? LOL. LOL. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really it is little old lady and little old man, just so you know. FLK is funny looking kid. <laughs> I shouldn't have even told you guys that. <laughs> That's hilarious. I know. Okay. Um, so it, it is true when he said there is a gallows humor. And I, that can be horrific mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, but sometimes we need to keep our mouth shut. I know that. <laughs> That's what the manager walks around. Ah, ah, you know, it's a fishbowl. <laughs> Lives you save. That, that's such a good thing. We had a guy that comes. He still comes once a year because we saved his, and we, he had a heart attack 10 years ago, and he comes every year and brings a big thing of fruit. Aww. You know, um, so those kind of things are really, it makes it really worthwhile. And once an ER nurse, always an ER nurse. Again, assessment work. <coughs> crazy people about assessing. Um, we just love the thrill, just like he said, you know, of the crazy, it's chaotic, it's nuts, you know, but everybody kind of works together, so. Okay, any questions, you guys? So I know I wanna, well, I'm gonna really try, okay, I, I don't know if you guys all know this, but I, again, I'm, I've tried, and we're gonna, I'm really gonna push, so you get to spend four hours in the ER. Um,